Hey, I'm Craig. Welcome back to Fight the Flat Earth, the channel that is going to stomp stupidity into the ground with the help of the best community in the world. Today on episode 6 of Explaining Simple Stuff to Flurfs, we're going to explain why the Bedford Level Experiment does not prove a flat Earth. See, these morons have a habit of taking something that in no way proves what they want it to and saying it proves what they want it to. So let's laugh at how stupid they are and learn something while we're at it. We're living on a disc floating through space with a tiny sun. Thanks guys for watching and welcome to my first video of 2019. I have a massive schedule ahead of me for this channel because I've enjoyed doing it so much, so I'm gonna do it a whole bunch more. And also my wife seems to be encouraging it because she's actually getting a chance to play the Xbox now I'm busy with editing videos and stuff. If you check the community tab on my channel, then you'll see the schedule for January. I'll update that regularly. And also on every Sunday, there'll be a coming up on FTFE video to explain what's going on for the next week. Now back to this video, we're gonna have a look at another thing that Flurfs use as a go-to proof of flat earth. So what was the Bedford level experiment and who was involved? Okay. Samuel Burley Rowbottom, better known throughout the scientific community as Parallax. Wow, Parallax? That's a badass nickname. I want one. Sounds like it's from the Matrix or something. I wonder if Daniel Pratt can think of a nickname for me. Bald ass cross-eyed mongoloid clown. Nah, um, you're, you're right, mate. I'll, um, I'll, I'll stick to fight. In 1881, he had published this book, Earth Not a Globe. Outlining dozens of experiments performed over many years, it quickly became the standard authority for anti-globularists. Perhaps the most significant experiments were those carried out on a canal known as the Old Bedford Level. Why are Fleur videos so badly made? The resolution is potato and the sound's even worse. Located in Cambridgeshire, England, the canal is perfectly straight over an uninterrupted six-mile stretch. While there, Parallax conducted many experiments, all towards one conclusion, to prove that the surface of the water in the canal was indeed perfectly flat. In one experiment, a boat carrying a flag rode from one bridge to another six miles away. An observer with a telescope placed eight inches above the surface of the water found that the flag and the boat were distinctly visible throughout the entire distance. If the Earth is a sphere with a circumference of 25,000 miles, then over a distance of six miles, the second bridge should mathematically be 16 feet below the observer's eye line. So, <laughs> Parallax's observations were of no curve over six miles. He repeated the observation many times throughout the year, but the problems that he had were things like he only had the telescope eight inches above the water, which meant that it was more susceptible to refraction because usually above the water, there's a colder, denser layer of air, which can cause light to refract up. This will of course allow you to see things that are further away than you should be able to see. Another thing is I don't think Parallax understood what we really should be able to see over a distance of six miles. How about we go and do a bit of math? Over to the Flat Earth Classroom. <laughs> Okay, so the Bedford level is done over a six mile stretch of water. What is six miles in relation to the size of the Earth? To figure that out, we divide the six miles by X, where X equals the degree of the arc. And then this equals the circumference of the Earth, which is 25,000 miles divided by 360, which is the amount of degrees in a circle. To find X, first rearrange to 25,000 divided by X equals 360 times six. Then we get X equals 2,160 divided by 25,000, to solve for x and get 0.0864. This means that the six miles of the Bedford level is 0.086 degrees of the arc of the circumference of the earth. So we see that the entire length is less than nine one hundredths of a degree of an arc, but it's even less than that if you're trying to figure out how much is behind the curve. 
As this image demonstrates, it would be the horizon dip that would be behind the curve. And if we do the math for that, we get 0 0.015 degrees of an arc. This means to say that the Earth is flat from Parallax's experiment, you have to assume that light can't refract what we are seeing by 1.5 hundredths of a degree. This proof and the writings in his book Zectic Astronomy led to the creation of the modern flat Earth movement. So as soon as I figure out how to invent a time machine, I know who to go back and have a little word with. This is not the end of the story of the Bedford Level experiment. And luckily for me, I've just met a real life scientist. I'd like to introduce you guys to Scientist Mel, someone who I could only ever hope to be half as smart as. Her channel is a live streaming science channel that includes a 24 hour live stream of scientific information. And I'm gonna let her explain to you what happened next. His flat experiment led to the modern flat earth movement, which sparked the scrutiny of a particular scientist who later regretted his decision of getting involved. So who is this scientist you say that was involved with this particular thing? Alfred Russell Wallace. He is actually a founder of modern biology. And like many of us, he was gobsmacked, puzzled, confused, and boggled by the Flat Earth Movement. He read this book by Roe Botham, aka Parallax, and found it to be nonsensical, and he decided to take it upon himself to debunk Flat Earth. Well, if you've been on the internet at all, you kind of know how that tends to go, especially if you've tried to engage with Flat Earth people. Well, let's go ahead and tell Alfred's story. In 1870, John Hampton published an ad in a paper essentially giving a 500 gold British pound bounty by flat earthers to debunk Roe Botham's experiment using the same canal. Hampton was a Protestant rector's son who read that book by William Carter called Theoretical Astronomy Explained and Exposed. So he read a book one time and he decided, well, this and this other book by Parallax, this is definitive proof. Well, hmm. Hampton, like Carpenter, wanted to rid the world of the round earth lie and persist that the earth was flat. Wallace thought it would be easy money to debunk this as a simple telescope experiment would show he is correct. It's what we call the Bedford Level Experiment. What he failed to realize is that flat earth people are not rational. They ignored his experiment and evidence and insisted they were right. So if you've ever been on the internet, then you're quite familiar with these types of tactics by individuals who indulge in this flat earth type of fantasy. All right, so let's talk about the experiment itself. He needed a telescope, black band on a pole that was the same height as the scope, a red disc that was the same height as the scope, this was disc A, and disc B, which was just about four feet lower than A. So here's a schematic sketch of what he did. So we have the telescope, that's the section on the left of the picture there. The red disc A is the same height as the scope. The red disc B is four feet lower than A. So what's the rationale? If the disc at the same height of the telescope is in line with the black band on that pole, C, then it's a flat Earth. If not, it's round. And his experiment corrected for any refraction. So here's another sketch of the view from the telescope. So you can kind of see with the black band and um, with red disc A and B, A is on top as the same height of the telescope and B is four feet lower. So we can go back and take a look. There we go. If it's if A is the same height as the telescope and the black band flat earth, if not round, well that was the view that he saw looking through the telescope. Here are the sketches that they drew of what they saw looking through the telescope. So they show the inversion of the telescope. Now this is drawn by Hampton's referee, William Carpenter, and Dr. Culture, who was Wallace's referee. So they wanted people there to verify that the data was correct. The experiment was successful in showing the Earth's curvature. So what happened after that? <laughs> 
What do you think happened? Let's, let's mull that over. Okay, well, Hampton would not look into the telescope and said that he trusted Carpenter's view. Yet both views presented the same, exact same data. The data was sent to John Walsh, who was the editor of the Field magazine, who confirmed Wallace as the winner of the bet and published the results. Hampton had to pay the 500 gold British pounds, but sued Wallace for 15 years, trying to get the money back and even sent abusive letters as well as death threats. Wallace, in turn, had libel suits against Hampton, as well as court or orders for him to cease and desist. So it got on a legal level of abuse and harassment in regards to Hampton and Wallace. So flat earthers, but why? But why? <laughs> Thanks, Mel, for letting me use that clip. If you guys would like to see the entire video that clip's from, then click on the link above and subscribe to Scientist Mel if you'd like to increase your IQ points. So, even back then, this whole thing was debunked. But for some reason, fast forward to 2016 and a bunch of flat earthers tried to recreate the experiment. Let's have a look at how that went. All in all, about 50 members of the Flat Earth UK group attended this event. The group met at the Three Pickerels pub for about an hour of some much needed meet and greet time. It's a rather lonely experience to see the world as we do and be surrounded with people who can't. And while it is a relief to connect with others via social media, nothing beats meeting bright, intelligent, light-minded people that you can actually talk to. Oh my God, it's sponge bath. Bright and intelligent people. You know what, Dave? I really, really hope that one day you can look back at this video and feel shame about what you just said. Murray Ferguson had travelled down from Scotland to provide us with the use of his kayak, and the intrepid Matthew Seddon volunteered to paddle it. And while he got acquainted with the kayak, we set about attaching a high-powered green laser to the back of it. I love how they apparently just duct tape that laser to the kayak. I wonder if they spent any time actually trying to make sure it was level. So we had to use our best judgement to place the laser as level as possible. So, no then which was actually higher than the waders we'd brought along. We also had a dry suit that leaked, <laughs> and since nobody there wanted to sacrifice a tripod to the water, it was decided to film the kayak from the bridge, and I would don the not-so-dry suit, then perhaps take pictures from the water once Matthew had reached the end. Is everybody paying attention to the amount of preparation that they've gone through for this? There's one kayak, which someone had to bring from Scotland. They've got one pair of leaky waders, They've got a laser that's just randomly taped to the back of a kayak. You've got to wonder if this is the standard level of flurf experimentation. Matthew began to paddle towards Welney Bridge with three high-powered cameras with telephoto lenses, a telescope Take and care. multiple pairs of eyes soon. trained on him. There was a thrill of excitement that's when he got uh, about half a mile away when we started seeing flashes of laser light from the back of the kayak. But the excitement soon faded when we realised that the laser must have been angled up towards us. So as he got further away, the laser would point higher and higher into the sky. Well, there's that brilliant preparation coming in, Dave. Well done. And let's take a look at where the people are filming it from. Yeah, they're on a bridge about a metre and a half above the surface of the water. Back to the classroom. <laughs> To calculate the distance to the horizon, you use the simple formula d equals 3.57 times the square root of r, where d is the distance to the horizon and r is the height of the observer. By standing on a bridge of 1.5 meters means the average person's viewing height would be about 3.25 meters. And when you crunch the numbers, that means that they should see the horizon about 4 miles away. That means they're reducing the horizon drop even more and making less work for refraction. They haven't thought this through at all. When we arrive back at Welsh's Dam, Matthew had progressed about four miles and could no longer be seen by the naked eye. However, he was clearly visible in the camera screens. 500 years ago, observers would claim that they could see ships disappear over the horizon hull first, just as Matthew had done to our naked eyes. However, these ancient observers did not have access to the Nikon Finepix P900, so an enduring myth was dispelled 
and that so-called proof of the curvature of the Earth was rendered invalid. This series of time-lapse images provided by MIT, I believe, is therefore a deliberate lie. Dave, I've just explained to you how the horizon is further away than you seem to think it is. And also I'm going to point out that the conditions that you have are really, really piss poor, making it really hard to see anything with the naked eye. However, you yourself have just said that you have in the camera got the person and they haven't gone over the horizon. Yet in the video you just showed of MIT, it was in the camera going over the horizon. So you can't really compare the two until you actually film something going over the horizon. Do you even listen to yourself? Although the experiment was a rather ad hoc affair and not performed under ideal conditions, not a hint of curvature was detected. So I'm gonna let you guys decide if you think Dave's little experiment was valid. And I bet you're gonna say no and walk away with the knowledge that if some flurf tells you the Bedford level experiment proves the earth is flat, you can tell them that they are talking absolute shite. That's all for today. Make sure you guys come back on Friday for the start of a new series called Flurf Say What? Where we take a look at some of the stupid things flurfs have been saying in my comments section. And trust me, there's a lot of stupid things the flurfs have been saying in my comments section. Thank you again to scientist Mel. Make sure you guys subscribe to her. And also recently I was interviewed by the Aussie flurf destroyer Critical Think. Click the link above to watch that and make sure you subscribe. And also a special massive thanks to my patrons. You guys are awesome. Remember, stupidity is not a right. Fight the flat earth. We're living on a disc floating through space with a tiny sun. Fight the flat earth.